I have to speak for 10 minutes. No, 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 no. no. Either that or you stall because people didn't come to see you. They came to see Carla who scheduled at 9 10. Yeah, no, that's fine. That gives me extra 10 minutes. That's good. <laughs> yes. So they told me that I have to entertain you for 10 minutes, but I'm not so good in entertainment. So I will just uh, have the pleasure to introduce uh, Carla, which is from the from Cornell University. She is the founder of the Institute for Computational Sustainability. Uh, Carla is a computer scientist uh, of Portuguese origin. Yes. Uh, All of and uh, <laughs> I don't think I will spend more of, no, the, ten, of the ten minutes. <laughs> Carla, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Alex. <laughs> yes. Thank you for this amazing workshop and for having me here. My talk is a little, maybe a, 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 a slightly different picture, but uh, uh, I will talk at some point a little mechanism design uh, a bit, but I thought I would tell you, uh, uh, you know, about computational sustainability and uh, and uh, about uh, you know AI and how in, in, I'm really focusing on uh, 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 advancing scientific discovery. And uh, yeah, I guess this doesn't work. Oh, it does. <coughs> so let me, you know, in case you wonder what computational sustainability is, you know, this is a, 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 a new interdisciplinary field that really the idea is to use computational methods to address the sustainability in terms of the, the vision for sustainability is really sustainable development. And uh, uh, Marta uh, yesterday gave a very nice chronology of uh, sustainability. A, a key point is indeed back in '87, the Brentland report that uh, uh, you know introduced the notion of sustainable development. Is developed that meets the needs of the present without compromising uh, future generations. But f future generations, they they stress you know because often people think of sustainability just environment. They stress that now, you know, sustainable development really encompasses balancing uh, environmental, economic, and societal needs. And as you are familiar, uh, you know, more recently, the, the United Nations put forward the sustainable development goals, so there are the 15 goals. Of course, you know, in general, people have no clue about this. This audience knows all about the sustainable development goals. So that's good. But I see, you know, sustainable development really. The ultimate goal is human well-being, and uh, and uh, uh, that's the big picture. Of course, if we are trying to tackle these problems, this is highly interdisciplinary, which makes you know very challenging for us. Uh, I always like thanking uh, NSF, you know, frankly, NSF really has supported the, the, this research, you know, back in uh, 2007, we had a large expedition in computing award that really allowed us to, to you know, uh, uh, establish this field. We had a second expedition, uh, with a, a large network that will compass net involving several universities that really uh, uh, allowed us to, to push this uh, field uh, uh, significantly. Uh, we are also pushing, you know, this AI for science and uh, we actually started the center recently and uh, 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 again, intersection of AI, sustainability, science, you know, material science, physics and biology this is all funded by uh, uh, a program for postdocs by the Schmidt Futures. And more recently, we are starting an AI for Climate uh, uh, Institute, actually, it's very recent. And there, actually, I will see many, many questions concerning mechanism design because, you know, the goal is really to accelerate adap adaptation to climate change and mitigation and really. Uh, 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 address uh, uh, carbon markets. So there will be really opportunities for uh, um, 
mechanism design. <clears throat> of course, I always like thanking my students because in the end they are the, you guys are here, they, they are the, the ones, who, the bees who actually do the work. So, thank to all my students. So, today I thought I would give you a perspective in terms of uh, uh, AI, uh, AI to accelerate scientific discovery and improve decision making. I, 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 several people mentioned decision making and uh, you know, I will give you a sample of uh, uh, projects as an example, for example, uh, AI to combat uh, uh, the decline of biodiversity. I will talk about AI to reduce adverse impacts on people and nature of the Amazon the hydropower expansion. There have been a huge uh, 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 proliferation of dams in the Amazon and I'll talk about that. And maybe I'll talk, to talk a little bit about AI to accelerate uh, uh, materials discovery for renewable energy. So, what is exciting about uh, this, uh, all these projects, you know, as, as computer science, you know, they all may seem completely separate, etc. But one thing I will emphasize throughout the, this talk is you know, the synergies, and I find it very rewarding, you know, by working on boards, I actually develop very exciting models that are allowing me to predict better properties for materials. So all the synergies is really, you know, a, a key aspect of computer uh, science, as you know. The notion of reduction, we actually see them in practice, so I'll highlight that. So, from a computational <coughs> point of view, I will talk about, uh, you know, uh, bird conservation and uh, uh, in particular multi-label learning and challenge in citizen science. I will talk about uh, AI for balancing environment, economic uh, and socioeconomic needs. The main topic is going to be, you know, how do we design more ethical decision support systems and I will talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, multi-criteria optimization and uh, computing the Pareto frontier and uh, I will talk then about uh, AI for accelerating discovery of materials and here is basically uh, about the challenge of you know doing discovery with very no label data so how can we do this unsupervised uh, 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 learning uh, uh, when we really don't have a lot of uh, label data. We have a ton of data, but not label data. So, I'll start with the bird conservation. As you, you know, we have witnessed an incredible de decline in, in species. And, you know, one question that's central in terms of biodiversity research is to understand how species are distributed across uh, uh, landscapes over time. And to do this, typically, you know, we combine all kinds of data from a variety of sensors, but also, you know, Landsat, you know, satellites, remote sending, etc. but also uh, a very sophisticated, I realize it's cutting a bit of my talk, but that's okay. A very sophisticated center, that's the human center, human sensor. So, the Cornell has this uh, lab, the lab, uh, lab of ornithology. They, they, we have this program, eBird. eBird is a citizen science program. Anybody can submit uh, uh, bird observations from age 8 to uh, 98 or more. And so we have, you know, lots of volunteers, almost a million, that, who have submitted a ton of observations and in fact, the, 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 the time is, would be building the Empire State building more than four times. And by combining this, the data from the eBird with the environmental data, we can really develop these uh, 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 adaptive spatial and temporal models to, to uh, uncover the, 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 the bird uh, uh, migration than the patterns of occurrence and absence of the species. And in fact, we use this data to 
inform, for example, the state of the birds report is based on this data. What you see here is actually the output of a machine learning model. This model is a single species model, so what we've been doing now is you know, to in, uh, improve the, uh, 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 the accuracy and the performance of the models and also to really understand the, the uh, interactions of species, we are developing joint species distribution models. But you know, these models are very important because they allow us, and here you have uh, an example of uh, you know, mechanism design where basically you, know, you want to conserve uh, uh, land, you want to protect the species. This is an example of how we are using this uh, uh, in com uh, combination with the Nature Conservancy to provide habitat for birds. So, you know, there has been tre a tremendous drought in California, in, uh, uh, depending on the years. So, in order to provide habitat for the species, basically, you see this is the, the Pacific Migration Flyway that <coughs> we can predict quite accurately. And uh, so based on that, you know, we can, uh, the Nature Conservancy allows, it, or has this bidding process, this rever uh, combinatorial reverse auctions, and the idea is rather, you know, buying land would be very expensive and you could not buy the entire land, uh, you know, for the birds. But what, what you can do is, coinciding with the bug migration, the, the farmers can submit bids to uh, keep um, the water in the rice fields and that provides habitat for the birds. And so, you know, that is a very nice and relatively inexpensive way of creating habitat and this has really uh, generated uh, uh, substantial habitat for the birds. And this is only possible because of this uh, you know, very dynamic uh, 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 models that can, uh, you know, uh, predict and combine with combinatorial reverse auction. So, so this is a, a good example of, you know, mechanism design to, 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 uh, for conservation. As I mentioned before, you know, the, the standard models used by ecologists, and uh, in fact a lot of the models are really single species models, but, you know, it's really ecologists know that uh, it's very important to, to understand the interactions of species with the, with the environment but also with each other. And so part of our work has been really to develop these uh, joint species distribution models and uh, but it is actually very challenging from a computational point of view. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, if we want to develop the joint species distribution models, we have to, you know, uh, estimate the, this, uh, the covariance matrix and standard models don't do that. Just a very high level, we actually, what we've done is we have, you know, incorporated this uh, uh, multivariate probit model, which is uh, a Gaussian model with deep learning, and so we have basically an encoder that produces this structure latent space and that will be really uh, 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 computing the, the mean for this uh, 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 multivariate Gaussian and, and uh, the uh, covariance matrix. As I said, you know, this is actually challenged, like I don't know if you are familiar, for example, VAEs, uh, variation autoencoders, assume the, the matrix is just a, a, a diagonal matrix, so it's, you know, assume, basically they assume independence. But, uh, but it is key to actually uh, compute the interactions, and here I show it at a very high level. And I'm showing this because I will show that other very different problems can leverage from the same uh, 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 idea where we have a latent space that's in this case keeping track of the, the mu for the birds and the, the, the covariance and then we can compute the joint species distributions. So with this now we can actually uh, 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 predict uh, uh, jointly the species. What you see here now is an animation 
with the 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 migration patterns of 41 species, you know, joining. In fact, this uh, 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 40, 40, there's uh, one missing here. The 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 wobbler distribution. So, you know, and this actually what what was important for us is by working on this, we actually realized that it was super important to understand the interactions of species. And that's why we actually developed this uh, idea of uh, uh, an interpretable latent space. And I'll show how that plays a, a key role in other models. So here we show you know, the projections of uh, the, the latent space, the habitat interactions, the birds and the species interactions. And you know this allows the ecologists to actually validate our models very, uh, you know, carefully. And you know, again, this model is uh, developed for initially for joint species distribution, but it's a very general model. In fact, we use this model also for other uh, 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 applications, including you know multi-object detection for computer vision and. Uh, 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 material science, etc. In fact, we extended this, <laughs> is Jude here? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we had a collaboration and he was part of this collaboration with the Gulf of Maine. We extended this model for fish, for predicting the biomass of fish, but you know, more interest, I mean, more interesting in the sense that quite different. We actually extended this model uh, a variation of this model to predict the density of states for materials discovery and uh, 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 again it's a very different domain but essential you know you can think of uh, a regression problem where you want to estimate in this case the density of states or uh, the species of abundance for fish so well you know all this relies on um, citizen science and citizen science you know that's a, a very nice way of acquiring a lot of data but there's a fundamental problem you know i mean obviously you know we cannot really tell the citizens where to go you know they are not paid and therefore uh, uh, you know they really collect the, uh, the, uh, the the data based on their preference on convenience etc and in fact if you look at here we see, you know, we see almost where the cities are because, you know, that's the bias that you get from this data. So one issue is how can we try, I mean, we, we try to correct for these, uh, 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 the bias via uh, the algorithms themselves, but we actually are also developing these uh, games. And again, this is another good example of uh, mechanism design to to uh, uh, incentivize people to go and collect uh, distributions in a more uniform way. And in fact, so we use this uh, principal agent framework where eBoard, you know, that's the principal, is going to replace uh, basically the game, replace points uh, uh, so, so people can collect the points and at the end of the, the season, they will uh, uh, they get uh, uh, prizes proportional to the the number of points they collect, and so 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 what's the game? We have to design the game as you know this by level optimization problem where we place the points knowing that the citizens of the e board see the points and they are going to you know maximize their own utilities and move accordingly to their interests and the points they collect. And we want to do this in a way that is going to induce a more uniform distribution. So this is a bi-level optimization problem. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there's, that includes two problems. You know, the pricing problem, where to place the points. Here, we just place the points and we don't, uh, uh, you know, they get prizes. Interestingly, we ran the same uh, 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 game in Africa there to collect the data for vegetation, and there we actually uh, pay the, the, the herders uh, money 
little money for us, a lot for them. Here we just give prices. And so there's the pricing problem and then there's the identification problem where we need to uh, 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 identify the, the preference of the users so that we can you know, run the game accordingly. So, and actually, Yeshan was super involved in this uh, 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 game. In fact, you know, there, he, there is Yeshan there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we were quite surprised, you know, when we launched this. And, you know, the nice thing about working with, you know, like the Lava Fall, Lava Fornitology, it's a very long word, so we just say Lava Fall, uh, uh, is that, you know, when we come up with these ideas, they say, oh, this is amazing, and in the, in literally, like in a month, they implemented the game for us. I mean, so that was very exciting, and now they actually have, they have application for the desert, for example, to, in California, where they want to understand the impact of solar, uh, uh, solar, the plant, no, what do you call, you know, panels, uh, panels. panels but uh, the farms, solar, solar, farms. solar farms, correct, uh, and so they ran this game, <coughs> and you see here, we were able to get people to go to other places to make, you know, less concentrated, so that was quite exciting and positive, so, let me now talk about another very different problem and here, you know, this is, I think it connects with this group nicely. It is this idea that indeed when you are, uh, you know, designing, <coughs> when you have uh, decision support systems, you cannot just, you know, optimize with respect to a single goal. And basically, you know, we've been working uh, 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 studying uh, strategic planning for for uh, the placement of hydropower dams in in in, uh, in in the Amazon, not just uh, Brazil. This is a, 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 a dam in Brazil, and so the from a computational perspective, this is really how you to uh, really do multi-objective decision making or design more ethical uh, AI systems that consider a variety of criteria instead of, you know, a single uh, uh, objective energy. So basically, oh, about 200 dams have already been built and they are planning over 300 new dams for for the Amazon area and so a key question is you know how to select the the dams to to, to build and so this is really you know the way I like phrasing this is this idea that we need to develop more ethical systems that are going to look at trade-offs and understand, you know, the trade-offs with respect to different objectives. Because if you think of a, a river, you know, a river or other power dams do provide energy, but you know, fish, you know, the populations really rely on uh, freshwater uh, fish, sediments and nutrients. The connectivity is key for transportation, navigation, fish migration. And you know, uh, uh, there's also this uh, the, the 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 river. If it gets disturbed, it, you know how it regulates itself. But of course, there's also deforestation. You know, displacement of populations, flooded farmland, and you know, we always think of uh, hydropower dams as clean energy. Correct? That's what we think we are getting. Well, it turns out that. Quite often, uh, dams can uh, uh, flood huge areas, which you know leads uh, <coughs> to the decomposition of organic matter and uh, uh, release of methane. So, dams can actually be dirtier than coal. So, so that's not nice. So, we've been looking at uh, you know how to do strategic planning uh, in terms of. Uh, dams and, and really by studying the Pareto frontier. I guess uh, you are familiar with the Pareto frontier here. I show an example where 
with two criteria. This is either power energy versus ecological value. If I don't build any dams, obviously I don't get any energy, but I keep all the ecological value. If I build all the dams, I have a lot of energy, but I destroy the, completely the ecological value. So here you have a situation in between, and this case is dominating this one because for the same energy I can get much better ecological value. So this configuration of dams dominates this. And for you to see in terms of, for example, if I'm going to look at the criteria connectivity, you know, this has a much better connectivity because I'm placing, you know, the dams away from the mouth of the river. So, so I will not get into the, the, the technical details, but, you know, obviously computing the Pareto frontier is a, a, a very challenged computational problem. So, interestingly, here, you know, and frankly, I never thought this would happen to me in real life. You know, when we talk about fully polynomial time approximation schemes, all that fancy uh, uh, algorithmic language, but actually here we have that beautiful situation. Because given that the tree, sorry, the river is a tree, you know, as you know in computer science, often when we have trees, we can exploit the, 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 the tree structure and, and use some divide and conquer algorithms uh, to, to uh, 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 actually have uh, approximation with guarantees. So we develop an efficiently uh, approximate uh, algorithm for this, uh, an FPTAS, a fully polynomial time approximation. So this is basically based on dynamic programming and you know the the main challenge for these algorithms, and the more criteria you have, the you know the the the, the more challenge it is because computing the Pareto frontier is really exponential in the number of criteria, and so the the key challenge is to remove these dominating solutions. How can we do that fast? And so we develop an algorithm that actually that's very general that can remove uh, dominated solutions in uh, uh, order n log n by using some kind of general uh, divide and conquer algorithm and have other uh, 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 strategies. In fact, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, if you guys are using only Python, yeah, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> I'm sorry to give you the bad news. And in fact, this is a, a good example where, you know, I had actually a postdoc who, who working on this and basically implemented this algorithm in Python. And so, you know, the, the Amazon basin is huge and there's this, I used to call the little Marion, are there, there are many languages here, but, which is, you know, a sub-basin, it's the river. But, you know, I actually have been to the, Maringan and it is majestic, it's not baby Maringan, but in the big picture of the Amazon, the Maringan is just a sub-basin here. It's just a little sub-basin and, and very small compared to the, the big thing. However, just for that sub-basin, a Python algorithm with two criteria, after five days it was still running. And in C++, we could compute that the, without the fancy uh, 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 algorithm to remove solutions. Without, with C++, we could compute it in one minute. I mean, crazy. I mean, it is really insane. And, uh, and obviously, you know, for the entire Amazon, we could, can actually compute the exact Pareto frontier for two criteria in a question of, again, a few minutes. Of course, when we add more criteria, e eventually this really, we, you know, we can, so this algorithm allows us to, to, to uh, compute the the the, uh, the Pareto frontier with the guarantee. So we, it's a trade-off. I can say, 
well, I want the exact perithrontia, which for the entire Amazon, for for more than two criteria, we, we, we can't really do it in reasonable time. Or I can say I, I'm willing to get uh, the Pareto Frontier with, you know, an epsilon of 0 0.01. Or, you know, you can give the guarantee 1%, 2%, 10%. For, for example, for six criteria, we can only give a very, very loose guarantee. But so that's the trade-off. So here I show basically uh, <coughs> the, the example to show what you see here is, and you know, visualizing it's another challenge. You know, when you have many, uh, several criteria, two criteria, it's obviously easy to visualize. More than two, it becomes very difficult, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so here you see the uh, uh, Pareto frontier for energy and river connectivity, and here we plot the Pareto frontier, uh, assuming that you know we uh, we we were able we plot the Pareto frontier before any dam uh, 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 had been built. Correct. So here we have the the optimal Pareto frontier. What I show here is the situation today. You know, the existing dams are right there with this amount of energy and this amount of connectivity. So what we can emphasize here is this is the foregone environmental benefits, correct? For this amount of energy, I could have had much, much better connectivity if I had picked better dams. So I lost this. Uh, uh, environment benefits, or these are the foregone power er earnings. I could have had much, uh, much higher level of energy, of, uh, you know, destroying, fragmenting the river for the same amount. And you know, here is the Pareto frontier now going forward. So we, you see, this area was all gone. Of course, we have, you know. We are looking at a multitude of criteria and you know connectivity, sediment, people, etc. And here I mentioned at the beginning the Pareto frontier is a little odd here because here we are actually minimizing uh, carbon emissions. So if we had you know we could have uh, plotted the negative of this, that's why the shape of the Pareto frontier is different because here we want to you know, for a given install, install capacity, uh, minimize the uh, carbon, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a case where, you see, all these solutions are dirtier than coal. And it is, you know, a little paradoxical because, I mean, it was counterintuitive, the fact that, you know, you can have really, really bad solutions that are dirtier than coal, even though in general, you think of hydropower dams as uh, clean uh, energy. And in fact, here we look at uh, the, 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 the projections for the, the, you know, the 2030 agenda and compare, you know, how we would be placed and the big message is we are getting really uh, off that track. But the main message here is you need to choose uh, dams properly, otherwise you, you can have solutions that are dirtier than coal. Here, you know, basically, and somebody yesterday we were talking about, or you know, like Malin was asking, oh, you know, how we decide. Indeed, in the end, you know, decision makers have to make decisions, you know, but at least we tell them the scenarios, correct? And, you know, this allows us, for example, to identify dams that are really bad in all the solutions. So, you know, those are the ones we are not going to, in fact, we have this paper in science and we are not, you know, advocating for any particular solution. But this is like a framework that really allows them to, to understand, you know, the impacts with respect to the different uh, uh, dams and make solutions. You see here that we compare the Pareto frontiers for different criteria, 
and you see that uh, uh, you know connectivity we uh, there's a huge gap what we could have uh, uh, obtained versus where we are another one fish biodiversity is really being affected dramatically so you know this is uh, 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 important for them to 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 understand the, the trade-offs and in fact you know we actually developed these two amazon eco vistas where you see literally because we are computing several criteria it doesn't make really sense to just look at two dimensions those are easier for us to see but you need to think about you know the six criteria and just for you to see uh, uh, and i'm pointing to this group and particularly you are nick 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 nicholas the number of solutions we obtain here are in the order of billions you know because the more criteria you add then you can differentiate solutions correct so it grows really exponentially it's crazy but then you know this tool allows us to for example uh, 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 and I'll show here here we say okay we want just solutions with the uh, uh, eight, eight, 80 gigawatts so now we are constraining we can in fact in fact I, I have a student working on you know <coughs> generating the Pareto frontier with bounds so that allows us to actually eliminate more solutions and here we are constraining the energy to just 80 uh, uh, <coughs> watts and then we that allows us to reduce you know the number of solutions dramatically and you can play with this uh, this thing you know con uh, uh, with the bombs and and uh, uh, to look at different solutions or then you can look at the separate uh, uh, Pareto frontiers but to be honest you know Communicating this Pareto frontier is in itself a big challenge because you know there are so many solutions and we are not really suggesting a single one, but we believe that by giving these tools that that's helpful. So, so this goes to when? I'm, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm. So my final topic is, uh, so I, I, I thought I would sample some uh, uh, projects to cover different topics. And you know, this is uh, uh, concerns, you know, using, you know, AI and uh, for accelerating uh, uh, discovery, scientific discovery. And in fact, I mean, I, I, I have to say, ChatGPT is taking over uh, uh, rapidly, you know, may, my own research, you know, I have actually always, I mean, I'm very much interested in obviously con uh, sustainability, etc. but I'm really passionate about, you know, AI algorithms and uh, so I, because of that, <laughs> you know, somebody who was uh, Zoe, I'm always picking on Zoe, I'm <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> But you were talking about, you know, going where the data, where we have the data, which is on is a, 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 an issue. But I admit and confess that I also tend to go towards problems that, you know, the state of the art is not going to work, where we do need to push the frontiers of the AI and because that's my area and so I want to contribute that way. And, and I think, you know, science is really the next frontier for AI. You know, ChatGPT is very good, but coming up with discovery, I think for a while, but not long, it's still, you know, a, a, a huge challenge. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So basically, I'm going to talk about, you know, scientific discovery in a context where we really don't have label data, you know to train on and and in particular just I give you a very you know uh, 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 back in 2010 you know the Obama administration uh, launched this program the materials genome initiative really to accelerate the pace of discovery of new materials and uh, uh, reduce the cost and you know this is really exciting for AI because you know it really uh, 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 is uh, uh, based on you know using uh, massive uh, computation to uh, 
you know, interpret data and, and uh, do discovery. I have been working with, uh, uh, you know, several groups at Cornell and also Caltech and focusing on so solar fuels. And contra contrary to, you know, solar panels, solar fuels can actually be stored and used later. So we are not dependent on, uh, you know, the in in intermittence of the sun. I can, you know, generate the solar fuels, store them and use them at night. Uh, just a very, you know, at a high level, how do they do with these materials discovery, you know, they use these techniques, co-spectering techniques, you can think of, you know, let's say you have a silicon wafer and then you do atomic spray painting of, let's say, three metals, you know, uh, gold, silver and bronze, and so you get this mixed uh, 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 thin uh, uh, film and then typically you do annealing etc and with that you can generate lots of lots of uh, materials that uh, 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 result from the combination of these uh, three uh, uh, elements and uh, and synthesis so to understand the materials it's important you know, to characterize them, and often they use X-ray diffraction pattern, X-ray diffraction, like high energy. This is the synchrotron actually at Cornell, using high energy to characterize the the materials. This is very similar. You are familiar with obviously DNA. That's what uh, you know Watson and Crick did using uh, uh, X-rays to identify the, the 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 structure of DNA. So but here is applied to materials and you know this is really you know inferring the crystal structure of the materials based on x-ray is very challenging particularly because actually the structures to, can get mixed up and so this while this can be done we can you know synthesize lots of materials a day and characterize lots of materials a day you know, this task of inferring the structure of materials from X-rays is really tedious and they can do a few systems a year. So, so that's what we are trying to automate. Uh, more formally, basically, you know, this problem is now I put here a, a ternary representation. Here you have uh, ferro that you have iron, aluminum, and silicon, three materials, and you see they got mixed up. For example, here, you would have 50% of iron and 50% of aluminum. Here, you see, so you get uh, uh, the mix, and these are samples that we can collect, and what you have here is the, the X-ray diffraction pattern. So we, we we take the samples to the synchrotron and get the X-ray diffraction pattern. So your problem, the problem we are trying to solve is identify the different regions that are formed because each region corresponds to a different material. And so, you know, basically we want to output the different M regions, K pure regions, like this is a pure, this is a pure, this is a mix, and we want to also give you the x-ray, the, the, the pattern that characterizes that, that region. So you could think of this as clustering, except, you know, it has to be a clustering that has to satisfy thermodynamic rules, which I'm not going to go in detail, but basically, you know, the phases are connected and then there are some rules that says, well, if I have a mixture of three elements, then I can have at most explain that with at most three phases of crystal structure. So there are all these rules that have to be satisfied and you know a clustering algorithm is not going to give you that. Another way here is for example I give you this point and this is a pure phase and I exhibit you know the pattern. This point is a mix so I want to actually show you the, the two patterns that uh, correspond to two crystal structures that explain that point. So that's what I want to do. So 
this this problem is relatively easy, but uh, you know, like when we write develop methodology, number one, I always tell my students we have to develop general algorithms. It can't be just for a single thing, so we'd better go and find other uh, problems that are similar and can you know do this. And you know. And in fact, when you write this in a, for a computer science audience, they immediately say, this does not belong here, it goes somewhere else, correct? So, we made, I made up this uh, little problem that is, you know, basically multi-amnist, everybody knows multi-amnist, the, the amnist, correct? Sudoku where here, if you look at this, this is basically two Sudoku, I assume everybody has played uh, no Sudoku, correct? So these are two Sudokus, and the, uh, the task is I give you this, and you want to demix these two, demix the digits, so you you have two Sudokus satisfying the Sudoku rules. It's like you demix crystal structures satisfying thermodynamic rules. Here you demix characters satisfying Sudoku rules. And you know, interestingly. This is, a, 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 again, a particular case of a more general problem that, for example, uh, we do a lot of, for the birds, you know, uh, flight call detection and bird vocalization, and again, you are given an audio recording, you want to separate the sounds, separating the, the bird sounds from the rest, it is another, you know, source separation problem. So all these problems are computationally very similar, and we are actually working on all of them. And actually, also music separation. You know, I listen to a piece, and I want to know what instruments are playing there. So all these problems are very similar, computationally speaking. Of course, you know, why is this so challenging? Because in our case, we do not have label data. We have zero label data. We have data and not even a lot of data and so you know the current state of the art really is uh, failed to capture the underlying physics and and therefore the way we do this we combine you know machine learning with symbolic AI to do this so just for you to have a sense I mean if you look at this can you tell me what's there I mean can you actually guess <laughs> I mean, you see, you know, numbers or letters, but you don't know exactly what it is, correct? It's hard. Now, if I tell you, well, this comes from two Sudokus, you know, where you cannot repeat a, a, a symbol in a row and in a column, maybe now you can start reasoning about it. And that's exactly what we did. You know, we, we are using this problem with unlabeled data, and, and we can actually separate this uh, 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 two Sudokus by, you know, combining deep learning with reason, uh, reason about prior knowledge, where uh, here prior knowledge basically is the Sudoku rules, correct? And, uh, you know, do you have a question? Yeah, if you like. Oh, no, so, I love this prior knowledge. Do you also have some prior knowledge of what a digit is and what the letter is. That is very good. I, I have prior knowledge about what a perfect digit is, but I actually don't have training data on the overlapping But I do assume that I, you know, we know vaguely what the, the digits are. Very, that is a very good, very good point. And so, you know, basically again, and, and ironically, this uh, structure was inspired by the birds, where we have an encoder that produces a latent space, and this latent space actually right, is going to keep track of the, the probability of the digit, the possible digits and the shape of the digits, and then we have a generative decoder that is going to reconstruct the image. And, you know, again, this is very similar to the, the bird, uh, 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 the one that we developed to predict bird, the giant species distributions. You know, just as a detail, you know, you may say, and in fact, we had, you know, we, 
his paper was actually published in Nature, uh, and one key question was, oh, you know, why isn't this just optimization, correct? You could think because we don't have any label data, and we actually show that even though we don't need a ton of data, we need about a hundred Sudoku instances because you learn the structure across the instances. So that allows you to actually, in addition to the rules that, that, that you, you encode, you, you get the, the, to learn across the instance the structure of the instance, which is very key. But of course, you know, I just showed you the Sudoku problem as a toy problem because it's easier to understand. The real problem is actually this problem, where we are given 300 unlabeled X-ray diffraction patterns, and to David's question, we know the theoretical crystal structures that have been observed in, uh, so this is the Bismarck of an oxide system, so we know theoretical crystal structures observed there, but these are not, without any noise, and our goal is to see if they characterize this. So we mix this to get this. And indeed, you know, here we were able to demix the crystal structures, and uh, we get the crystal structures here. And in fact, you know, they form all these regions. And contrarily to, for example, the, in the Sudoku, we knew a priori there were two overlapping Sudokus. Here, we don't know a priori if a region is going to be explained by one, two, or three. And you see, for example, A is explained by three phases, B by two, etc. So, uh, you know, and actually, this particular region, our collaborators uh, were able to uh, discover a new material for solar fuels. And as I said, you know, in contrast to the standard solar panel energy, uh, solar fuels can be stored for later use, which is very convenient. Again, you see, you know, the same very similar structure where we have an encoder produces a, 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 an interpretable uh, structure latent space. We can then use thermodynamic rules to reason about it, and the decoder in this case is a, 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 a Gaussian mixed model. And again, you see very similar to the structure of the Sudoku and the structure of these uh, uh, DNFs for the demixing is similar. The key is this interpretable latent space that allows us to reason about it. We are, you know, pushing this. We actually have another a big MURI, which is, a, you know, uh, uh, funded by uh, 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 FLSR. And the idea is to develop SAR, a scientific autonomous reason agent for materials discovery. And what you see here is a, you know, a depiction of SAR controlling. A, you know, this has the mixture of materials, and you see this laser is actually doing the annealing. And SAR is really deciding where to go and for how long it can control temperature and dual time to produce uh, this, uh, 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 the synthesis, and then we have uh, optical and uh, x-ray characterization of the materials. And here is the phase diagram for this. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, all these projects, you know, and that's a key rule for me, you know, I only work on projects if I have, you know, access to the highest level of expertise in the corresponding domain. And here is, you know, my colleagues, the, the material scientists, and the, actually this paper was led by a computer science together with the material science. So this is a student, uh, and this is a postdoc. Okay, so I, you know, again, I always make sure that we publish our work in CS, in computer science, but then, you know, this work has to be validated and go in the, you know, corresponding domain uh, journal so that we are not just you know making up stuff and and it, it makes it quite challenged there's a huge learning curve for the students but you know it's also rewarding so let me wrap up and uh, you know I gave you a few examples but you know we have many 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 projects and here you have this uh, uh, subway line 
and basically what I highlight is the lines here correspond to topics, you know, computational topics. And for example, I talked about this pattern the mixing for the Sudoku and for the, the crystal structure phase mapping. You see this blue line. And, but obviously we have other, we are working on stochastic uh, large scale spatial and temporal mod, uh, modeling and prediction, for example, for species distribution. We are working on you know, large scale spatial decision making, etc. So many, many other projects. But you know, we emphasize the cross cutting computational themes. And you know, that's what, and in fact, Sarah is not here, but I think. To some extent, we try to cre you know, create, you know, work on these projects, but then different students can leverage their expertise emphasizing different domains. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned too that uh, uh, I already emphasized it's also exciting because, you know, ideas that we, for example, we developed this model for, for, I'm sorry, <laughs> back to you guys, I just realized it, a little late. <laughs> uh, uh, so, for example, you know, really models that we developed for birds became key for, in, for materials discovery. And, you know, these, these synergies are really exciting and, and really give us, you know, new ways of thinking and by transferring knowledge across domains, which, by the way, chat GPT is going to be very good at, is really uh, empowering. Uh, I talked a lot about this line, you know, demixing Sudoku's or demixing crystal structures, and uh, but I also talked about, uh, you know, spatial, large uh, 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 spatial temporal and structure modeling and prediction for birds and uh, and uh, uh, materials, etc. You know, we've been talking a lot about AI, and over the you know recent, everybody talks about data-driven AI, machine learning, etc. And of course, you know, that's true given the huge progress in terms of image re uh, identification, face and speech recognition <laughs> in chat GPT. But, you know, challenge when it comes to scientific discovery and decision making, you know, I think we still have a long way to go. There are many challenges that we need to address, you know. Typically, we want to, you know, understand and explain phenomena beyond, beyond just prediction. We want to understand causation beyond correlation. You know, typically we have very small uh, uh, and uh, label data sets and a lot of the tasks, actually the majority of the tasks are unsupervised. And then we, when it comes to decision making, we need to make choices and often, you know, combinatorial choices and really with respect to many criteria, we, we should really understand this, uh, you know, Pareto frontiers. And, you know, high dimensionality of the problems, which I think actually AI can really play a big role in uh, helping us think in high dimensions. So, you know, pure data-driven <coughs> AI is not really suitable for scientific discovery and decision making. So I'm in favor of combining data and knowledge uh, to, to really be able to reason from first principles, reason about uncertainty, and dealing with combinatorial decisions. And, you know, I also think that going, uh, you know, uh, high dimension and uh, understanding for interferences is important to develop more ethical uh, AI systems. In summary, you know, this has been quite an exciting journey for me. I focus a lot on this in, in terms of advancing computational sustainability. I see this really a two-way street that on one hand, you know, we are injecting computational thinking insights and methodologies to tackle these very challenging problems. But on the other hand, we also get, you know, new challenge problems and, and often actually by talking to the scientists you come up, they actually have very good ideas poorly computationally speaking in general, but that's where we come in and, uh, and uh, we can identify new cooperative micro problems in computer science and hopefully have some societal impact. Thank you.
Okay, thanks. You have already a question. I've been waiting. <laughs> okay, thanks, Carla, for this exciting talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. So, Fred, who is. I was first. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, please. Thank you. So, so when I first saw your diagram with the, you know, showing what the little ah. materials, uh -huh. my first thought was to go back to yesterday's discussion about index numbers. Yeah, yeah. And I said, how on earth do you measure ecological value when there are so many different components to it? So then, of course, I understood that you were doing this, uh, the same diagram for each of the different components of ecological value. But even then, <coughs> I would have some questions. So biodiversity yes. being one of those things, there is no one single index no. for biodiversity. Yeah, it yeah, consists yeah. of so many different components. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do you do that? How, how do you actually produce the, the y-axis? Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. And, and you know, like for example, for the Amazon, we are looking at the Amazon basin, and actually now we are looking at uh, uh, another uh, basin in uh, in Colombia, the Magdalena Basin. That, for example, there we could potentially consider the about 300 species of fish. And so we could potentially look at the Pareto frontier for all of them. And of course, you know, that becomes overwhelming. So we are going to maybe just look at main, you know, main species or genera or something. But in the end, for example, you know, we did collapse, uh, even uh, I showed here uh, um, uh, uh, a Pareto frontier for fish biodiversity we ended up collapsing the, the fish biodiversity to an index because, you know, to have some way of uh, 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 coping with this. If we go species by species, it becomes overwhelming. So, you know, it's, it's a good question, you know. We don't do a single index, but we still have to somehow you know, convert, the, and in the end, for us to perform these optimizations, obviously, we have to convert things into numbers, correct? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, these are very, very good questions, and it's very dependent. That's why, even for species, we think it's important to consider the different species, because different, you know, local uh, indigenous population appreciate different fish. And therefore, we want to, you know, highlight the impacts for this particular species because it's going to affect this particular uh, 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 group of people depending on them. So, so you see, you can go back and forth, aggregate, and then provide the finer uh, 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 characterization. So, yeah, there's not a, a good answer or a single answer for that. The, the related question. Uh, so we have different. Uh, some of it's easy, I assume. So connectivity, you have uh, you know, zero to one hundred. That's a percentage. No, connectivity is very. You right. know, actually, that was the first criterion that we used because we didn't depend on anybody to give us the data. From satellite, we can, uh, uh, you know, get the the river network and literally, you know, measure each little leg. You know, by the way. This, uh, and it's quite remarkable, you know, we are talking about a, about five million uh, river segments. Yeah, so, so, and we can actually compute all of this. So, okay. I didn't explain exactly how we do, but, you know, we, we you, you know, we, we basically have a graph. We, you know, I mean, I, it would take me, you know, interestingly, the, the, the nodes correspond to building dams, and then you know the nodes correspond to the areas that will be affected by the dam if you build that. So, but uh, yeah, but the connectivity was the first one we actually used because it was very easy to get the, the data for that. We just needed satellite data, and then we could get the the you know the all the data for for the lengths of the segments. 
So I, and I don't want to dominate this debate for other people, but one more question before we set up the floor. Uh, depopulation. Yeah. How can you measure that? Very good question. And in fact, you know, in fact, for example, I admit for our uh, science paper, we didn't even include that because, you know, we couldn't even vet the data very carefully. And it's not clear that building a dam is going, I mean, there are two possible, you know. One is really deep play, you know, uh, uh, people uh, are, will be, have to move. So, so then we can measure the number of people we will be affected by that, correct? Or, you know, another thing we are looking at is destruction of farmland, because that's also happening. But, you know, I mean, there are many, many more criteria that we actually have not, we don't have the data for those criteria, but like even economic criteria. We have emphasized more, you know, ecology and, the, you know, social impacts, but uh, but uh, 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 populations, it may be that the population will benefit for having, you know, energy nearby. So, uh, yeah, it's not clear exactly how to measure all these uh, uh, effects. But the big lesson, you know, the, the big conclusions, again, we never, we don't <coughs> suggest build this dam or not. We actually have all kinds of metrics then to try to have a bit of a sense of a rank, how we would rank a, 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 a dam. So if a, a dam barely appears on the Pareto per year, that is a good indication this dam is probably not good, correct? Because it's always dominated by others. Of course, our big message was, you know, you cannot, you need to really reason across many criteria because if you just do with respect to connectivity, you have a solution. If you now add more criteria, you will have fundamentally different solutions. And more important, and another message we wanted to put across is, you'd better do this at a large scale, because if you just plan for Brazil, you know, you are going to, you know, basically kill all the connectivity and the setting and production, etc. for uh, other countries. So, so that was kind of a big message in the paper, you know. Really, you need to, to uh, 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 plan at the, uh, you know, uh, the scale of the entire Amazon, the scale of, the, you know, there's many criteria, uh, uh, or at least, you know, key relevant criteria, and, and uh, really, and, you know, because otherwise you, there will be substantially foregone environmental and economic benefits. Oh my. Uh, so thanks for a fascinating talk. It was just uh, I was just curious about one specific thing, which is uh, when you're doing the eBirds, um, the bi-level um, optimization okay. thing. Uh, how do you so? So I understand the problem, right? That is, if you don't know, uh, you know, that you want to incentivize people to go to places where they wouldn't ordinarily go. But how do you estimate their utility functions to begin with to design the reward structure? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, a problem that you learn over time, correct? But, uh, you know, so initially you have some sense and you assume, you know, part of the maybe you, uh, spec, you, you know, hypothesize distance is an issue, etc. But over time you get this uh, data, correct? And your problem is really and that's a beautiful question because your problem is exactly, you know, one problem is what I call the pricing problem, is how do I place the points, assuming I know how the borders are, are moving, and the other one is learning the preference of the borders, the, the, the e-borders, uh, to, you know, for us to predict their movements. And, you know, that's a learning problem and if you, I mean, a little more technically, and actually this was, you know, beautiful work by Ye Shan, you know, this is, you know, the, 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 the pricing problem is, you know, how to set up the points. And we actually formulated the, the uh, uh, identification problem as almost a knapsack problem where the birders, the e-birders are trying to collect as many points as they can, but we have to learn the, the coefficients of the knapsack. And 
you know, interestingly, because the knapsack actually can be solved again with dynamic programming, then dynamic programming can be, you know, flattened and transformed into inequality, inequalities. We actually are able to fold the problem of the, the, the users into the main one as a single one, and again, we can provide some approximation results. I mean, it's, but in it, part of the issue is to learn the preferences, and that is what we do over time. Very good question. Yeah, uh, thank you. It was really fascinating. Um, and it's just great to see this work for the, for the world. Yeah, thank um, you. I have a question about the dams. The, the, um, I was wondering if, like, if over time dam technology will get better and, like, maybe cause less dam, each dam may cause less damage, the whole creative frontier might get better, like, you'll have better choices in the future, I guess. So could that play into your thinking, like, what to do now? If you know, like, if it's true that in the future the creative frontier will be better, you might think about what to do now, like, knowing mm -hmm. like, later on you'll have better things to do. Yeah, I guess, you know, uh, I mean, maybe part of that is even the technology is changing. For example, now you are actually seeing, which is, and we are looking in the, into actually a, a broader notion of portfolios as opposed to just them portfolios. Now we think of, you know, in fact, we are working with uh, Colombia, you know, this Magdalena for a net zero uh, agenda. And there we are thinking not just dams, but other form, uh, uh, you know, renewable energy. Right. And, and dams, for example, are playing a key role in terms of using the dams to actually also store energy. You know, that's becoming a big thing. Yeah. You know, there are other crazy ideas. In fact, we have a little piece uh, in nature which I honestly think it is a bad idea, and we kind of say it's probably a bad idea, but now a lot of countries are using, you know, the area of the dams for floating photovoltaics, which, you know, it's another way of harvesting solar energy. But I think that's going to call, to kill all the, you know, uh, everything, <laughs> because they then are deprived of sun, so that sounds to me, but, you know, so, we are going towards, uh, you know, this idea of uh, uh, different uh, 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 portfolios with different uh, 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 types of energy in addition to hydropower, you know, wind and solar, uh, uh, etc. And uh, and I think you know that may make more sense to to uh, understand the, the energy needs of a country. So. Very good question, but but hopefully, you know, it, it, this reminds me. I actually, I thought your question was very good, and maybe I'm going to answer in a very different way. But for example, I just mentioned we we, we just uh, started and we got this uh, uh, AI uh, AI Institute NSF uh, AI Institute, and there, you know, a big thing is carbon markets, and you, we think that. You know the from the Pareto frontier is and so that you know typically the Pareto frontier does move. You know that's how it is. But you know if you find new opportunities for you know like you start using carbon as a commodity, actually now the Pareto frontier can move forward because now there are opportunities. You 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 value carbon and in fact there, for example, I think. You know, I, you guys know about food stamps. You know where you have all kinds of uh, you know, sugary stuff, and because there's all this lobby for corn syrup and all this thing, and in fact, it's actually very hard to to have like the, the other kind of healthy meals because of uh, you know uh, uh, all the lobby, etc. This is <laughs> anyway. But I think, for example, if the farmers can start playing in this carbon uh, uh, market, then maybe they will be less interested in producing all the other. They now focus on, you know, the carbon and and value the carbon. So we think that the Pareto frontier actually can move forward because of that. So, so that really is when there's fundamental, you know, uh, 
different technology of different way of evolving uh, the, the, the commodities. So very interesting. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. It's always about the dams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, uh, first of all, does the impact of the dams uh, is it independent or it is combinatorial? Very good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, if they are very close to each other, they definitely affect each other, correct? But typically, because of that, they are. You know, I mean, it, 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 quite uh, far from each other, so we as we don't assume they are affecting each other. But but uh, but we we do uh, you know compute the the cumulative effects, but we 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 consider them independent. Good good case. Okay, so uh, are the criteria independent? So is it preferential independence among the criteria? Because uh, if we build the Pareto frontier with the idea that they are independent, it will take a certain shape. But if they are not, uh, so if preferences on connectivity are related to preferences on some other... On fish, and fish, they are, they are, no? yeah, but... Then in this case, the, the Pareto frontier will be quite different. Well, but because we compute them simultaneously, you know, they affect each other, so that is accounted for. What I think is interesting and what, uh, you know, we are looking into is to what extent we can, you know, identify key criteria that will uh, somehow encapsulate a set of criteria, because we cannot compute the Pareto frontier for a billion criteria, correct? Like, for example, for, for the biodiversity, there are, you know, like 300 fish species. We are now thinking maybe let's try to even look at the phylogenetic trees to identify, you know, key representative species, you know, to compute the, the Pareto frontier for those species. But but because we actually are, con the, the, the fact they are uh, dependent is not a problem, you know, because we are computing jointly. I mean, one issue is, uh, you know, trying to estimate this uh, uh, species, you know, because in the end we are going to try to compute how this will affect the abundance of the species. That, for example, we, that's why we also need, you know, I, I was trying to give you a picture that all these things are somehow connected, you know, like we really need very good models to predict the biodiversity for us then to compute how these things are affected. So, yeah, very good question. But the way we are thinking is trying to identify key, more representative species so then we don't have to compute the Pareto frontier for a billion things because we can't, correct? Uh, now, my, my last question, not Perfect. related to the dams. Yeah. Uh, we, when we were talking about uh, uh, let's say, in which direction go in discovering new materials, etc. Et no? Now, with, uh, because I've been confronted with a similar topic, no? which is the following one. You are constructing points of the Pareto frontier which are interested because of their utility. No? But uh, you want also to consider points of the Pareto frontier who might not be that promising, but they are very different. No? Uh, we have seen that in uh, uh, drugs uh, studies. No? We want to develop new drugs uh, so for diseases. So you want to develop, there is a part of molecules that are promising, no? So you want to test these ones, not all of them, of course, eh? but you also want to test some very different molecules. Although they are not as promising as the first ones, but because they are very different, 
they might be of interest because they could develop a completely new you know, uh, way. So it's not only how promising is the paradigm of India, but also how diverse is the paradigm of India. You know? uh, do, you, do you see a way to how to do uh, how to consider these two ways of uh, let's say uh, studying the Pareto from here. You know? Because the Pareto from here is sometimes is immense, as you have already mm -hmm. said. No? So you want to focus in regions of the Pareto from here. No? And then it could be interesting to keep part of the Pareto from here. One, because it promises good results. The other one, because it is very diverse. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And I guess, you know, that's like a general question for us to to uh, study, you know, I mean, trade-offs like in computer science where you have these algorithms that the, you know, there's the exploration and exploitation trade-off, correct? And where you want, like, or if you go to the casino, you think this arm is the good one, you keep pushing it, but maybe you also want to, you know, try the other ones because who knows maybe they will give you you know a, 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 a better reward somehow so so yeah these trade-offs you know for the Pareto from here we actually you know exhaustively search the Pareto from here you know the results that I give you are exhausting going over the Pareto from here we can do this here a bit because of this unique situation where we have this river so we can use dynamic growing but in fact at some point you know it becomes prohibitive and and the number of solutions is you know, crazy I mean it is really you know, billions trillions and and so because of that we are thinking in that's an, and you, what we are trying to understand is how can we summarize this uh, Pareto frontier to policy makers, you know, so, you know, so that's one thing. But, you know, another aspect that we are talking about, I think, is, you know, really how to search spaces and, for, you know, Sar, I, I mentioned this system here, which is interesting because this system, this system, we are looking at what it's called metastable materials. So metastable materials are materials that don't reach the equilibrium, so they can change. But, you know, by looking at these materials, you can expand dramatically the periodic table. And I will give you a good example of a metastable material that's changing over time, but I guess most people don't worry about it. Or diamonds. Diamonds is a, a form of carbon that is metastable. And of course, it's not changing. You know, it may take you know billions of years to change. But because of that, you see, we are looking exactly at uh, the. In fact, this apparatus here is you know really exploring different ways of synthesizing the material. So here you have the the that laser spike annealing is uh, doing doing the annealing of the materials and there we change the temperature and the, the duration of you know basically you are zapping the material for you know a second or so but depending on how you do this you can have fundamentally different materials you know and and so we are exploring exactly that's what we are doing there we are trying to uncover the entire a bit of sample you know uh, and producing the different you know this map of what you can do as you vary the temperature and the laser spike annealing this is actually a case where you have a single composition this bismuth oxide but then we want to explore the entire map as a function of uh, 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 the temperature and the dual time because you can get fundamentally different materials. So we are building these maps to try to do that. So, 
exploring, you know, maybe they, a lot of the regions are not very exciting, but, but basically we are trying to characterize the entire regions and have the, what it's called the phase diagram, where you, you know that as a function of temperature and UL time, you are going to get different materials. So, not sure if I answered your question, but, but, but essentially, you know, I think this is really this exploitation, exploration business that, you know, it's very common for us to do in, the, in, in other disciplines. And, and it's about scientific discovery, you know, a bit like that. We are trying to automate this, you know, this process. I think uh, we're half an hour late. No. Oh, we are half an hour late. Ah, but he has so, a question. Oh, you after. Ah, okay. okay. That. So I'm afraid that, that uh, <laughs> the superior controller tells that we can't go ahead. Well, sorry for being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but because it has been a lovely discussion. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Yeah. That's fun. And I'm so happy that, you know, I put the Pareto key. Because uh, I, mean, I saw you guys, I said I need to talk about it. I didn't know what to talk. I mean, I could have talked about you know all these projects that I have here, and I picked three of these. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so. Can I ask you a question? Oh, sure, Patrick. Yes. So, can you answer the independence of the criteria? Do we still have them? Yes. So, they are not.